Okay, so we'll be talking about population and community ecology today. So I'm sure many of many people have heard of Asian carps, which are the uh, important food source in Asia. But in the U.S., they're considered a uh, the considered an, an invasive species, and there is no natural predators for them. And studying the effects of the interaction between such invasive species and the local econ ecological community <clears throat> is one aspect of ecology. So populations have obviously a total number of indi individuals. We refer to that as the population size, and that can be expressed in terms of population density or number of individuals per unit area. And the populations are dynamic entities that fluctuate in size and density depending on changes in the environment and disasters. And the statistic, statistical study of populations and their changes is just called the demography. And if you notice here, there's a relationship between population and body mass in Australian mammals. This is the log of body mass, and here's the density. So density goes up as body size decrease. Why would that be? Because smaller animals, smaller organisms need less food and resources. So more of the small creatures can be supported. So how do you estimate the population size? If the area is small enough, you could count the all, all individuals, but I mean, that's the most accurate way of doing it, but it's not always possible. So instead, tailored sampling methods are uh, used for different organisms. One example would be quadrat, or basically a grid or square on the ground. And you just count the individual individuals within the grid. And you, it needs to be repeated at random places to be accurate. And it only works on immobile or slow creatures. Then for uh, small mobile animals, there's a, a method of market, mark and recapture. It involves catching then marking the animals, then releasing the animals, and then recatching. And then the total population is estimated using this equation here which uh, involves marked first uh, total number of marked animals in the first catch and total caught in the second catch and number of marked animals in the second catch here. So if 80 mice were caught in the first uh, catch and marked and released, and in the second catch, if you caught 100 total and 20 of those it, were marked, then it then the number of the individuals is 80 times 100 total divided by 20, or about 400. And population can also be uh, described using species distribution pattern, distribution of individuals within a, uh, a habitat given time, at any given time. Distributions can be either random, clumped, or uniform. So random distribution would be something like dandelion shown here. There's no pattern to it. It's just reflects wind dispersion and the favorable habitat. Clumped distribution reflects plant dropping seeds down on the ground or animals and social group. And the uniform distribution is seen in plants that inhibit other growth or terrestrial animals which create a regular pattern. So distribution of population can show how they interact with each other. Solitary species are usually in random distribution and they may have, or, or they may have difficulty finding mates because just as lower density species may. And the demography refers to the population change over time involves studying birth rates, death rates, and life, exp life expectancies. And these change changes can be listed on a life table, shown on the right here, life table. And the life history of organism and life expectancy of individuals at each age is shown here. Age is shown here and number of dying, 
number of surviving, the mortality rate, life expectancy. So this is of Ovis Dali or sheep, Dali or Dal, Dal mountain sheep. So you can show any, uh, you can show the number of dying in each age group, the mortality rate, expectancy each at each interval. So between, so how do we read this? Between year or age of three to four years, that's this group here, 12 have died. among the 776 individuals. So what is the mortality rate? That's just 12 divided by 776 times the total number of original, which is 15.5, as shown here. If a sheep survives to the first year, what is its life expectancy? Surviving to First year is here. Life expectancy would be 7.7 .7 years. And we can also describe the survivorship curves for uh, different species. And there are different types of uh, survivorship curves. There's type one, type two, and type three. Type one involves low low mortality rate in the in the young, but most die in the old. So here's type one. Humans are considered type one. We survive. We, our survivorship is very high when we're young, and we die when we are old. Type two mortality rate is about constant. That's things like births throughout the lifespan, and the type three shows that young have the highest mortality and it declines as uh, it gets old. And those are things like trees, invertebrates. If you cared or reared your young, which curve would fit? It would be the top curve. We humans rear our young, so that's, that's why they survive so well. If you produce a lot of offsprings without any care, which curve would you fit? You would fit this curve here because and invertebrates do exactly that. And a lot of the young die as soon as they're born and few survive. And, and uh, growth and regulation, there are two models for population growth. One is the exponential, the other is logistic. Exponential is shown here. Logistic is shown here. Uh, exponential growth is possible only with infinite resources. Growth rate itself increases as the population increases and as you pass through the generation. Think of binary division. One becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, that becomes 16. And the population just grows up uh, exponentially. It produces a J-shaped curve. And the logistic growth is limited by the resources and the growth slows to a plateau due to carrying capacity. And it is, uh, shows S-shaped curve. And logistic growth assumes equal chance for uh, the survival for all people or all individuals. And they, but the individuals have phenotypic variations and they will be better adapted to future changes. And this results in intraspecific competition among members. The example of logistic growth um, east grown in ideal conditions shows S-shaped plateau. And this should be like something like that. It plateaus towards the carrying capacity. But the uh, real life fluctuation can be seen in seal populations in the panel B here. It's very noisy, but uh, get the idea. So what would happen if the food resource, food source disappears before uh, for the seals before or <laughs> due to overfishing? What will change in the graph? The carrying capacity will change. And seal population will adapt accordingly. 
Um, <clears throat> and then there's the uh, density re dependent regulation of population, which includes things like predation, inter and intra specific competition. Inter species competition is between different species. Intra would be within the same species. And obviously there's a, also a parasite. So experiment on mortality rates in high and low density population of donkeys, population of donkeys, have shown that juvenile mortality is higher in the higher density case because maternal malnutrition causes shortage of food. High density population is shown here. So mortality rate is much higher when they're very young because mothers are uh, undernourished or malnourished. And overall, the de uh, higher deaths in, ha uh, in high density population also. And density independent regulation of population include things like weather, disaster and pollution. And there are density dependent and independent factors that interact with each other. And deer population killed off in a harsh winter may recover better because if the density was high enough to begin with. So even if large part is uh, killed off, you still have enough individuals left over to, uh, to recover. And there are many, a few uh, demographic based population models. Demographics just such as rate, age of reproduction, number of offsprings, and so on can lead to specific adaptations of affecting the uh, population growth. There's the case selected species are adapted to stable, these are adapted to stable, predictable environment, and they exist around carrying capacity. So they tend to have fewer offsprings, but devote more resources for each offsprings, elephants, humans, and so on. And there are the R selected species. And these are adapted to unstable and unpredictable environment. And they produce large numbers of small offsprings, but do not provide parental care. And typically invertebrates, plants, uh, tend to have R selected species tend to be our story. Think about dandelion, how, how, how does it reproduce by sending out those tiny little seeds in the wind. And we come to the human uh, population. We are problematic because we alter our uh, environment to increase the carrying capacity. In other words, use of fossil fuels in food production will increase the carrying capacity. So some worry about the ability of Earth to sustain the, the growing population. It's been in exponential growth since about 1000 AD. And in recent years, it's just really took on, starting at about 1900 or um, uh, by the uh, industrialization that has finished. It took 125 years to add 1 billion by uh, 1930, and it took 12 years to to add another billion by 1999. And the overpopulation threatens the ecosystem and uh, biodiversity, which lowers the carrying capacity, capacity carrying capacity further. And the technology resets the carrying capacity for humans to overcome the density uh, dependent growth regulation. And it's the fossil fuel allow the mechanization about agriculture and also pesticides and fertilizers led, uh, led to reduced growth rate and caused accelerated growth rate. So age structure, population growth, economic, Age structure is the proportion of population in each age group. We call it also, uh, we used to call that uh, population pyramid, but now we know that it's not always in pyramidal shape. And this allows the prediction of population dynamics a little more accurately. Rapid growing countries 
are typically in stage one. People don't live uh, to old age, but people have a lot of ch children. Slow growing countries have fewer reproducing population, and that's more like slow growth. And Italy, Italy currently has zero population growth and has a stable population. This isn't really true. Uh, United States is a stable uh, population example. There is, uh, Italy is also in stage four. And the stage four shows the declining population. These are countries like South Korea, Japan, China, Germany, most of the developed world. They're in full on demographic clouds right now. So what is the long-term consequences of exponential human population growth? Uh, there was a book called Population Bond written by Paul, Paul Ehrlich. He wrote that the battle to feed all humanity is over. In 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death. At this rate, at this late date, nothing can prevent the substantial increase of world death rate. Obviously, that's an age well, but there's some truth in that. If the population continues to increase, lack of sufficient accesses for, for uh, resources like food and other things for some people will continue and cause problems. And also, as population increases, degradation to natural environment also increase. And many of the developing countries are unlikely to agree to global treaty to limit the deg degradation if it means they're uh, developing slower. And now we're entering the future with uncertainty about how to maintain the carrying capacity because we know the fossil fuels are running out. So that leads us to community ecology. Uh, population of one species don't live in isolation, but it lives, interacts with others in the habitat, forming an ecological community. And such, you know, such community contain interactions that include predation and herbivory. Predator-prey interaction involves one species killing and eating the other species. And the population size of predator and uh, prey are not constant but cycles in related way. An example is lynx and snowshoe hare, uh, example given here. You can see hare is shown in red and it always leads uh, the population of lynx. If hares go up, then lynx go up. As lynx go up, hares come down because they are getting eating, getting eating. And the cycle, this cycle is about 10 years old or 10 years in length uh, with lynx population lagging anywhere from one to two years behind the prey. So popul hair population goes up, lynx have more food, lynx population goes up until it reaches a certain threshold and too many hairs are eaten and the lynx population declines. So given that uh, predator prey, uh, many organisms have developed this defense me these defense mechanisms and uh, and predation and predator avoidance are very strongly selective. Any advantages in avoidance will become common in the population. And the common defenses are being uh, mechanical, chemical, physical, or behavioral. So funny, the honey locust tree uses thorn, like these sharp thorns, to prevent getting eaten. Fox gloves shown here makes toxin that cause nausea, vomiting, hallucination, or even death. And here's a bug called tropical walking stick. And here's a chameleon here. And they use body shapes and color to avoid detection. And others use behaviors to avoid predator, like plain dead, flock of birds, schools of fish. These confuses, confuses the uh, predator. Example of uh, animals playing dead would be an opossum from Ice Age. Defense, uh, yeah, and, and the, here's a fire bellied frog or toad. Right they use coloration, color, to warn that they are poisonous. 
and here's a an harmless hoverfly, which mimics wasp, which is shown here, to avoid predation. And another form of mimicry is shown here. All of these heliconias butterfly have defenses, but collectively they share the same warning coloration. So collectively they survive better. Uh, and, and all of those, all these uh, anim, uh, species have their own niche, and which is a unique set of resources that they, they, they use and includes interaction with other species as well. And the competitive exclusion principle states that two species cannot occupy the same niche in a habitat because they're constantly competing for each other with the same resources. So the example here is a Paramecium aurelia and Paramecium codata. And both species grown together, we see that aurelia outcompetes codata. And we get to symbiotic relationships. Um, they use a long and close long-term interactions between individuals of different species. One example is commensalism. One benefits, the other is not harmed. Southern mast weaver nesting in a tree does not harm the tree, but it benefits uh, the southern weaver, not the bird, weaver bird. Then there's a mutualism where both benefits. Termites have a protozoa or protist in their gut that digest cellulose using bacteria inside their own gut. And that releases glucose for the protozoa as well as the termite. And lichens, shown here, harbor algae for photosynthesis. We talked about the uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago. And there's the parasitism, one benefits, but the other is harmed. Example of that is tapeworms shown here in humans. They can live up to be 50 feet long. And another example example would be plasmodium falciparum, which causes malaria that is, lives inside the red blood cell. There's a cycle of tapeworm shown here. You can read that on your own. Um, so what are some of the characteristics shared by communities? So ecology, ecologists study community structures, size of populations, and dynamics, and how the interaction changes. Um, biodiversity is a measure that is wide, widely used uh, characteristic, a number of different species in an area. And the species richness is a number of species in a habitat or another unit. And this varies across the globe, obviously. It's related to latitude, greatest richness around the equator, and the least around the poles. And that's shown here. Number of mammal species per square kilometer. Um, relative species abundance is a number of individuals in a species relative to the total number of indiv individuals and then all species within the system. And the foundation species often, often have the highest relative abundance. And the uh, foundation species are those that form the base of the community with the greatest influence on its overall structure. And these are most often abundant primary producers. So here, corals are seen. Corals are considered a uh, foundational species. And th they also modify the environment to produce and maintain the habitats. Kelp forests off California coast, coral reef. And the keystone species, uh, uh, maintains a uh, presence of other species. The, as shown here, the intertidal sea star is an example of, example where the removal of it leads to overgrowth of mussels, which alters, in, uh, alters the community. 
and the tropical banded tetra also provides uh, nearly all phosphorus. And the invasive species that are not that are not native to the area, they can outcompete the native species. This example is Asian carp that colonize the uh, Mississippi River Basin. They're, they have no natural predator. <clears throat> so community and the community dynamics are the changes in community structures, as we have talked about, and the composition. And it's the study of you know studying that is studying how it changes. The the succession is the sequential appearance and disappearance of species given a community after a disturbance. And the primary succession occurs when new land is formed. The first species to settle the new land is called the pioneer species. Lava on Maui and the succulent uh, plant growing on it, shown here, is an example of pioneer species. Uh, eventually, the area may reach an equilibrium with different species different from the pioneer species. And the secondary succession occurs when the area is disturbed. And then the smaller population of surviving population, surviving species, repopulate the ecosystem. Example would be oak and hickory forest after a fire. Here's a pioneer species, intermediate species, climate, climax community. Um, then eventually, they will look similar to a community after before the disturbance. So think of think of this scenario as the scenario after the disturbance. Then the existing survivors will repopulate. But the legend that book chose is slightly problematic. Okay, we'll uh, live there for now.